I'd like to call uh, Sia, Sia Fair up to the stage. There he is. He's making his way up here. Sia is the CEO of InfoStream, uh, which is a software provider especially in uh, providing affordable cloud solutions to small businesses. <laughs> He's a frequent speaker at conferences that focus on SaaS and the internet. Bill, you know why you were there that book as a SaaS pioneer. That's your thing. You appreciate it. Jeremy Julian is uh, COO of Custom Business Solutions. That's a, a bar ISV specializing in solutions for restaurants. Jeremy's got 20 plus years of point of sale software and service experience, and he's known as one of the restaurant technology guys. Uh, his company was featured on the August 2016 cover of Business Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Josh Stanfield, he's the VP of Sales and Marketing at Flexible Point of Sale. Uh, he's an expert on the SaaS model, customer acquisition strategies, and software business metrics. And he's been actively involved in raising capital with multiple companies. Uh, Quetzal is a cloud-based point of sale software for the specialty retail market. The gentleman who is making his way to the AV stand right now is Rob Melcher. And uh, Rob just came flying in here after what, a good a, a weather delay? Was that right? mechanical delay. So he literally just got off his airplane and drove over here. So we're going to give him a minute to get mic'd up while we get started with the uh, with the panel. Rob is managing director uh, at SAS Capital, uh, which is a specialty debt lender that works exclusively with SAS companies. SAS Capital has done extensive research on the software space, including the white paper that uh, on valuation data that's found in the show books. So again, please welcome uh, Sia, Jeremy, Josh, and Rob. I'll let her on the So Business Solutions surveyed our software developer readers uh, late in 2016. And what we found in that survey is that uh, one of the key challenges that uh, ISVs face uh, across the board is um, adjusting prices, contracts, billings, discounting, tier pricing, uh, and, and, and working their way into SaaS. So we figured that would be a good place to start leading the conference out, to have a conversation about that and maybe share some best practices around uh, the pricing model, raising capital, uh, and building a reseller channel. Again, Abby has the handheld microphone, so please, as we get started here, uh, ask questions with Abby. Um, I thought we'd start maybe by just uh, getting a little bit of background information on each of your see if you can mind. Tell us a little bit about uh, the software that you sell and where we sell it to. Thank you. Uh, we, first of all, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Um, we provide cloud office to small businesses. We provide a uh, free desktop, which is purely cloud-based. And then our small business applications are the only pure cloud applications that our users buy. And when they buy that, we do revenue share with the software provider, with the ISV, and that's how we make our living. And how long have you been on the current pricing model that you're, that you're on? Uh, probably around 10 years. Okay. Let's see, by internet standards, we're definitely a granddaddy because we did cloud stuff before the word cloud was coined, but probably about 10 years. Okay. All right, Josh, how about yourself? How's the company and Capsule Point of Sale. We do an iPad point of sale solution uh, for low team retailers. Uh, from primarily, we focus on uh, clothing and, and footwear. Uh, we do cover some other uh, segments underneath that. Uh, Kessel's been around for about four and a half years, and we're in a launch phase now, as of early 2017. That's about it. We were on a, uh, a price for probably the last 12 months, and then the beginning of 2017, we shifted to, uh, we have one flat uh, fee, and that's really it. And if they want additional support, uh, they can bump it another $25 to $30 a month and get uh, you know, all the support that they'd like. Good. And okay. we're going to talk, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit on sure. that. We're talk to the discussion, why the change, and how you execute it on the change. Uh, Jeremy, if you mind tell us about your company. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you, uh, thank you, Business Solutions Magazine, for putting this on. It's right in my backyard. Uh, we live uh, close in our offices in Irvine. We primarily do um, 
restaurant point of sale. And so we started 20 plus years ago selling point of sale as a purchase and then about five years ago started writing a, a cloud-based point of sale and focused on the restaurant vertical as well. So that's kind of where my experience in the industry and myself came from. Okay. And your, your current pricing model has been in effect for how long? Um, pr pretty much since the inception, so over the last four years or so. Okay. And if you could each check that out and kind of talk a little bit about your, uh, how, the, how the KPI, the primary pricing method that you use. Um, is it per seat, per user, per uh, not at all. Uh, we uh, provide a number of different applications, so it depends on the application. Some are company-wide and some are per seed. Some are monthly and some are yearly. Uh, we have an app market that the users get to select what they are, that they would like to uh, purchase that suits them best. But because of the variety, there's not any uh, specific um, you know, plan. But our Skynet used to be per seed, and then, you know, we have made it uh, free, uh, like I said, in the past few years, and uh, so <laughs> there's a user base account, so each user gets their own Skynet okay. Josh? Uh, with Capsule, we do a per location uh, cost model, and so they can, uh, we wanted to make a very simple process when they're signing up, so we do by location. I think a lot of the competitors in the market would do buy terminal, and so we wanted to make it real simple. You have one location, that's one thing. <laughs> we're, I guess we're, we're similar to the rest of the industry where we sell by module and by um, terminal. So depending upon in restaurants, whether you're using for online ordering or table side ordering or um, traditional staff on sale, each of those are a different pricing model based on use case. Um, and when you're doing like table side ordering, like you might see at Chili's, it's a, it's a lot larger implementation, so the price per unit goes down. But if you're replacing traditional on a sale, it's kind of a fixed fee per month per term. Okay. Hey, can you, uh, sticking with you, uh, Jeremy, can you, can you talk a little bit about how your model your has changed over time and maybe why it's as changed? Um, I mean, Businesses in general, and especially at the restaurant vertical, I think are looking to get towards that OPEX type. You know, they don't want to buy hardware that they own forever. They want to just pay as they go. Um, you know, 60% of restaurants fail within the first 18 months. And so with that, the, the big capital upfront costs, um, they prefer to just spread it out. And it keeps us honest, make sure that we're delivering a service that's valuable to them. Um, and so it's changed the, what they're asking for. The commoditization of IT, I think, has also helped and hurt. Um, if you're able to adapt to it, I think it's been great. Many of the traditional um, resellers historically have made huge margins on their hardware platform. And as that margin has started to erode with the advent of the iPads and, and tablet based point of sale terminals, that business model has to change to more software and services. And so we were kind of in the forefront of that. Owning intellectual property to be able to do that gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah, just a quick follow on to that. You mentioned that so many of these uh, businesses who are out of business uh, in short order, really, you know, over there. This, this, the pricing model that you're on is that uh, expose you to more or less risk when that happens to the brand customer. It definitely exposes us to more risk. It makes sure that we're honest. I mean, I've got a couple of my team members here in the audience, and they, they would laugh just because it does keep us honest. It makes sure that make sure that we have to deliver our service because if we don't, the cost of entry and the barrier to entry used to be significant. Where you used to spend forty or fifty thousand dollars on a point of sale, it was a harder decision. You were much more invested than now. You might spend fifteen or twenty thousand dollars on that system. It's a much shorter purchase time and. Um, You've got to wrap other services around it in order to, to make it stickier, in my mind. Josh, has your pricing model changed at all in recent times? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I actually spent uh, a little bit of time in the enterprise space, and we did a lot of shifting around in that uh, with where we're at. We're in a small business uh, component of it, and so uh, it's pretty steady with where we're at. See it? So, for us, like I said, we went ahead and provided the free model. That was a shift. Uh, a while back, we were charging um, per installation. Like we went from a hundred thousand dollar one-time check to 
cancers a day. Because what the cloud did for people was very similar to what leasing did for cars. Before, uh, before that, people would need to say if they could afford a car or not. But now they're talking about what can I do to afford the monthly payments. And therefore, this is why upwards of 60% of cars are now leased versus purchased. So cloud wasn't just a delivery mechanism, but it was also a pricing revolution, if you will. So we went way back when from you know very large upfront costs to daily or monthly or uh, yearly prices. At the time, I remember I went to my team and I said, at some point they're all either going to think we're idiots or geniuses. So let's make sure it's the latter. <laughs> I would say to add on to, to my answer and kind of what Sia just said is, is I do think it gives the consumer, the end user, the flexibility to scale their solution up or down because, you know, seasonal things. They can throw an extra couple of devices or, you know, in, in cloud, you know, office suites. You want to expand because you're a retail market and during the holidays you're going to expand a little bit. It gives you that flexibility because the barrier to entry is significantly less, whereas before you would have to buy the bulk and then Kind of, kind of, so I think it gives our consumers and our end users a whole lot more flexibility to scale based on their business need as well. Sure. Yeah. And, it's, and it's introduced a new function, I think, as well, customer success, which I hope everyone's familiar with, whereas before, you know, you make the sale and it's done and there'd be support, but not necessarily an ongoing sort of relationship management to the same level, whereas now, with the cloud model, with the cloud pricing model, where they <clears throat> could be adding modules or adding seeds or everything. You want to nurture that relationship, and it's a lot more ongoing, um, collaborative type of relationship uh, to make sure they keep buying more of your stuff because they can't switch at any time because it's so relatively cheap for decision. So this whole new concept, there's a whole, you know, there's um, a lot of literature and all kinds of things written now about customer success, which is becoming a really, really important part of the cloud model. Uh, 
the, the idea was that I used to work for Steve Jobs for about uh, five years and with Next Computers, and then we had a really good uh, product, uh, product, which actually is whatever you see your Macs and iPhones. Basically, the root of it came with our Next Tech. And on a daily basis, we were losing to Microsoft. So when I uh, started InfoStreet, I was doing it uh, as an internet guy back in 1994. Most companies didn't know what to do with the internet. And then right around a year into it, I was thinking about it, and I thought that what operating system would beat Windows at the desktop because of the fact that you know we had a phenomenal operating system, but we couldn't beat the Microsoft uh, marketing machine. So I came up with no operating system at all. So back in 1995, a full 22 years ago, I set out to create a, back then we didn't know the word cloud, SaaS, or something like that. We, we, I set out to create a web-based operating system that people could run um, their applications on the browser and the operating system would be irrelevant. So that's when I knew before the words were coined. We have never ever in our 23 years history, we've never shipped software on a CD. We've always been an assassin. So my question, my question was, how did you know? <laughs> and it's like, when did you know? Well, way before as a service. <laughs> yeah, because, because, yeah, because of the fact that, you know, necessity is mother of invention. I was really frustrated that we had such a good product, but we could not compete. And sometimes, you, when you look at a competition, you need to look at alternative sources. By the way, you need to look at that for your pricing as well, because there are some things that, uh, you know, like no operating system at all was an alternative. Josh and Jeremy, I'm going to go out of the room and assume that for either one of you or both of you, transition to SaaS was a little more of a transition than it was for CI. Is that correct? <laughs> I can probably try to invent SaaS if that was your question. I didn't invent it either. You know, it's just like we, we stumbled upon it, if you will. Yeah, and Josh, go for it. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was really the only option. You know, and when you're catering to this market and you want someone to be able to afford a product that they may not be able to perform, uh, afford in a license model, uh, you know, that's the route we want to take. You know, the other component is, is uh, you know, uh, as the company continues to grow, that the valuation of a company that uses a traditional license model versus a SaaS model is completely different as well. Yeah, I, I mean, our very first client on this was not a SaaS model, but everybody else subsequently was. They kind of helped, you know, birth the product with us. Um, and we really only ever quoted one other potential client, uh, and that was for, I don't know, SpaceX. And they wanted, it. they needed to have it on site, and they couldn't pay a SaaS model. And that was just kind of a different, unique circumstance. Where we're like, okay, if Elon Musk wants us to sell him software. We should probably figure out how to change our business model a little bit. But beyond that, that was the only other person that we've ever bid out completely. And it, it does create a little bit of challenge, especially when you get to some larger clients. So I'm dealing with right now with a with a client that's got about 200 restaurant locations, and he's used to his capital budget. And he's used to going to the, the, the finance team and asking for a certain amount of money. And we're kind of going through the, the you know the arm wrestling of, well, this is so much less expensive over a three year period, you know, than, than doing it this way. And he's like, but I like having, you know, five million dollars to spend every year. It's like, stop thinking that way. Um, and so it has been a little bit of a transition going from, from this to SaaS, um, especially with clients that have embedded expectations on their business. Yeah, it does move it from a CapEx to an OpEx. Right? It does. And, 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 the people like it. Yeah. and neither do the IT people because they're used to being able to buy big and then get you know, the, the trip to Hawaii out of it or whatever, you know, whatever they, they're doing from it. But they're, they're figuring out how to change the presentation to their board or the presentation to their finance you know, group. So it's definitely a little bit different. A different sales process even to our own clients that want to buy it. But they're like, well, can't you just sell it to me and sell it to me up front? I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. Right. So even internally, we, we, we talk a lot of ISPs who still struggle with this. And I wouldn't say it's as big a struggle as it was a few years ago, but there's still a struggle around uh, around, around financing and transition, right? Like there's a bit of a fear around giving up that, that capital sale and moving to a, a subscription model. Um, companies struggle with how to figure that out. Did you, 
struggle with any of that yourselves, Rob, I invite you to kind of get some advice here. If you're struggling with any of that yourselves, what advice would you give the ISPs who are in that position who want to make that move where they're a little fearful of finances? Um, luckily, I think Salesforce has done a really good job of training the market that annual upfront is okay and makes sense. Um, and so that's a really good way to train. I mean, there's going to be a gap there for sure. You know, they can drop that sort of six figure um, revenue, you know, one time revenue to um, even like six, 60K, right, for an annual upfront. But at least if you make some of those sales, that helps get the cash in the door uh, early and often. Uh, and that's become totally industry standard and highly recommend that that's a, uh, a very common way to do it, I recommend that you do it. Um, from the survey, over 70% do annual contracts of, of the people that, that responded. Um, Multi-year all up front is a little trickier and we actually encourage our portfolio companies not to do it. It can be pretty dislocating uh, because you've now got your, your cash flow and your P&L are totally dislocated. You're, you're pulling so many years forward of cash and you're, you become really addicted to and dependent on that, those new bookings to maintain your spending habits, right? And you can get pretty out of your skis and if there's any kind of shock to the system, you're, you're pretty screwed. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's sort of my comment on multi year. But annual up front's the, the best way to do it as far as we've seen. But it's, uh, it is tricky. I, I would say we have done, most of our SaaS models are one year up front and then month to month after that. So you do end up getting the cash up front. But it definitely has been a, I mean, the salesperson's commissions have been harder to calculate and get them to sell it because it's spread for a big lump sum. Even our, our, our finance guy likes the cash up front. He likes to be able to have the cash in his hands versus, you know, so it's been an indication for him to show him over a three year period what the differential looks like so you don't get out over your skis. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's been an education process sure. and it's constant conversations that says, you know, this is the way we have to go. And we've got to make sure that we satisfy the people and keep it rolling because then you're not dependent uh, when you guys have the bar in the future conference and it's very similar. It's like you're always dependent on that next sale to make payroll next week, you know, on some of the smaller resellers. Well, in a SaaS model, you can, you know, recurring revenue was the theme when I was at the conference last May of the bar of the future and just kind of how does, how do you, how do you create a re recurring revenue model that keeps the lights on and keeps payroll paid when you don't sell anything? Yeah, it sounds like there's some cultural, perhaps there's some cultural uh, management. It's got to be, be top-down, right? I mean, it's got to come from the top and work its way down. Very much so. I mean, that's how we've been able to accomplish it. Yeah. Um, do you have comments here? Um, no. Okay. We'll go on to the next. Where's my, where's my, uh, my damn good ideas book? <laughs> Where is it? Well, it made its way back there already. Who's contributed something to the book so far? Oh, come on. We can do well, that. That's not bad. All right. <laughs> Contribution number one, find a new panel moderator. <laughs> Any questions for uh, for the panel as of yet? Uh, in terms Wait, we've got, got the mic in the middle. If, before we take the first question, can you switch your mic to the other side of your jacket? Of course I can. Sorry about that. In terms of order of magnitude, uh, moving from a, a capital expense to operational expense model for the companies, say a customer might have a $50,000 upfront capital expense for the old way of doing things that they're going to maybe $1,000 a month. Um, what is your time to pay back in terms of getting the same sort of revenue? And at what point are you actually net positive moving from a cap off to the operational? That's an excellent question. We'd like to take one. I can do. We so the payback period is a really important one, uh, and so we like to see portfolio companies have less than a year payback period. So whatever their their well their customer acquisition costs not not so <clears throat> to be clear they're not most of our companies were sort of born they're like five to ten years old and most of them sort of were born as SaaS companies a few of them have transitioned but they're not comparing to what they could have made selling the license model so what I'm talking about is um, payback for the acquisition cost of that customer so marketing spend and then sales comp <clears throat> so what it costs to acquire that company and sell to them when we've done the analysis it's been probably about anywhere between 
20 and 28 months, 26 months, comparing to, comparing to our traditional model as far as our profitability, like when do we when do we start to turn a profit more so than we would have taken all of the money up front. So it's about a two year deal, but our average client life cycle is about six and a half years. Yeah, that's an important point with the SaaS model is, yes, the annual contract value might be lower, obviously, than the full but over time, if you again customer success, retention, 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 upsell, they can become much more profitable than under the license model, potentially. Yeah, with uh, with us, one of the big ones that we look at is the lifetime value of the customer. Knowing the lifetime value, uh, you know, part of that uh, equation is understanding what your churn rate is as well, and then going in and figuring out what you're willing to pay for that customer. And uh, in the beginning stages, we believe that you can invest much heavily or heavier in acquiring those customers to validate the business and to acquire uh, customers. But that cost of acquisition should drive down, uh, you know, at a similar rate as far as you know your growth pattern. And so there's a couple, you know, a couple of those that uh, you know you really need to look at, and we've gone through them over and over again as far as when our marketing gets better. As our sales team gets more efficient, you know, there's a lot of variables in that. And you know, there's companies that will be very risky and invest 50% in a cost of acquisition. And there are companies that are much more uh, conservative and might put 20% or they're willing to pay 20% to acquire that customer. So, so uh, we believe in the CAC to our ratio, that is customer acquisition cost over the average revenue per user. And this is different from company to company, but you should be very mindful of your CAC to our ratio. For instance, cable companies spend around $768 to get you as a customer. This is why they want you to bundle because that average revenue per user will go up and then months become shorter. If you have a big churn, and you don't, you're not growing fast enough, the company is not gonna maintain the large customer acquisition cost. So you should be very mindful, and this is actually a formula that we use for our pricing as well, when we talk to our ISVs and say, you know, you wanna be in the app market, they say, well, what should I do the price for small business? We talk about this CAC to our ratio that you need to make sure that you have a certain amount of uh, time in mind that you're going to make that back and that has to be uh, you know one of the key performance indicators what would the market would bear in order to do that and then it actually leads itself if the market doesn't bear it very long uh, you know uh, time or a high price or something like that, then you need to fix it with volume. So it's a very multi-parameter formula. It's not just the one formula, but if you want to think about it as one, you have to be very mindful of your customer acquisition cost over your average revenue per year. Did you have a follow-up? You look like you had more you, more you want to um, Yeah, so some, one of the things that we're seeing is we have a hard, hardware component so we do a lot of stuff with RFID. I imagine other people are doing things with EMD or things that actually require a hardware investment by the customer. And then there's the software side. Software is very easy in terms of it's free once you've created it to sell and advertise over long periods of time. Do you guys separate out hardware, like real fixed hardware that your customer needs to buy, terminals, RFID, equipment, bar, hard assets versus software assets, and you guys separate those two out in terms of pricing. In terms of pricing. Uh, we have very few that are commingled, but they separate them out for sure. Or, or they bundle them up. It, it sounds like yours is more skewed towards the hardware is expensive. Uh, a few of ours, it's, it's bundled in because it's a smaller number. For us, it's separate contracts and we sell our hardware at very low, low margins just to try and get it in the door because really we're making our margin on the software and on professional services. That's where the growth is. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. We, uh, even with uh, with Castle and with the enterprise company that I was with previously, uh, we did not uh, do anything on the hardware component and allowed all of these sellers uh, to deal with that side of it. Yeah, and we're a pure cloud play and we don't have any hardware solutions. So we took the easy one that you know, one, one of the things you know with the on the monthly component is consistency as well. 
it's far easier to project out on things are going to go uh, based on those uh, prior trends. So consistency on the financial component of it uh, helps you know, with determining what type of uh, capital you need to either convert or to get in a company like this as well. Yeah, it's less lumpy. I think we'll all talk about that with the valuation thing for sure, but you know, that predictability adds to your value because you can see it coming for sure, as opposed to the lumpy thing. As it says, and you have to incentivize if someone is able to sell a monthly version, which I think is a question you're getting into, a monthly versus a yearly upfront. Uh, you know, what is the salesperson incentivized to do? You know, we would rather have it be very consistent than to not do that, but we do. We will offer like a twenty percent discount if someone wanted to pay on an annual uh, term. Would you prefer a monthly? Uh, what you guys, which would you prefer? Uh, as of right now, that's what we do. So uh, one last question, specific to SaaS for you, Bob, uh, from from me anyway. And we'll see if the, the audience has any questions. Why? Why, why only SaaS companies for, for SaaS? Yeah, it's more we developed this model around SaaS. It's not like we um, we picked it. Uh, or what I'm trying to say there, um, we developed our model for the SaaS market. So the, the the reason is the predictability of the cash flow. So we're lending against uh, we lend between three and seven times monthly recurring revenue. So it's all based on your recurring revenue, and that's the asset we're lending against. Software companies have tables and chairs and computers. That's not $3 million worth of stuff, but that recurring revenue stream from the customers is. And so we think even if there's a worst case scenario, another financial crisis, you can go into you know lockdown mode and just serve existing customers and pay us back over that recurring revenue over time. So that's, that's our whole thesis. So it's, it's around high retention rates growth to some degree, but not necessarily uh, and exactly that, the predictability of the cash flows. So even, and even like we have lots of multi-year contracts, but annual upfront, um, even if they're upfront and you have good retention, um, we can, you know, we have good, um, uh, high confidence that we'll renew and that cash will come into the future, even if it's already, you know, seven months in from the previous contract. Good. Okay, so I want to move on to uh, to, to talk about some uh, tier tier pricing. But before we do that, before we move off of the SaaS centric part of the conversation, does anyone have any further questions? Question back here. Yep. More of a comment than a question. Going back to the question before this, so we look at this a little bit differently than what you suggested on the SaaS model. And in our version of a SaaS model, the first S stands for solution, not software. But um, software without the hardware, a lot of times, is just a bunch of ones and zeros. And a lot of times, the hardware without the software is just a doorstop. So you need both of them. And so what we've done is come up with a hybrid SaaS where we allow them to put in the hardware, the software, the help desk contracts, warranties, everything across the board. But if I said to all of you, are you going to have the same cell phone in three years, you're probably going to tell me no. So what we do is we have everything come back after a period of time, whether it's two, three, five years, and we rip and replace everything. Software, hardware, warranty contracts, everything, so that everybody in your clients, and it's very sticky. They have to come back to you because you're going to give them the next best thing that's coming to market and put it into play. And when we've gone out and sold our solutions this way, we've been much more successful than breaking it out. Here's the plan for hardware, here's the plan for software, here's the plan for services. So just to comment a little, little something different, I think we're actually going to talk about that later on today. Thank you. Thanks for that. Does everyone know, uh, Mark, just just for the, the room's reference? Yeah? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Dave Zetnik, Optometrics, and I wanted to direct this question to the um, TOS resellers on the panel. And um, my question is, how do you see um, deployment with a SaaS-based model? And typically, um, to deploy a, a, a system on tablets and iPads uh, is less expensive. And um, also, I see a lot of companies 
try to simplify the implementation process. So that has had effect on the bottom line. Okay. Right on. Okay. On, uh, on our side, it's uh, you know it's customer driven, and so uh, it probably doesn't apply much to us. Yeah, but I'm saying. Um, and the two team members that I have here happen to be on the professional services side of our house. And so they uh, hopefully they won't throw anything at me up here. But uh, at the end of the day, we're looking for the long tail on this client. And so there's times that we, even in our traditional model, where we would want to even put out extra services beyond what we had committed to, to make sure that the client's satisfied. You know, retention is huge in the SaaS model especially. And so there's times that, you know, we'll forego short-term profit to make sure that we're going to keep this client happy longer term by just, I don't want to say throwing labor at it, but it does come back to also getting the scope defined very cleanly in the beginning. If the scope is not defined very cleanly in the beginning with what they're getting, then, um, you know, and I think that's where we add extra value. On the flip side of that is um, sometimes you can charge for that work and then roll it into the rest of your uh, offering to the rest of your customers, right? So you got somebody to pay for a feature, or um, we've had some companies refer to it as like roadmap advancing. So it's like, we're going to do this, but if you really want to um, move it to the front of the line, you can pay for it, we'll build it. We'll, it's going to go to everybody, but um, you know, if you want it today, we'll, we'll roll the roadmap advancing. So um, quickly on implementation, uh, I think whether your strategy is to not charge for it and lose money on it, or charge, you know, and make money on it, or break even on it. That's none. Of, all of those are fine, depending on what your strategy is. You just need to be really clear and honest with yourself on it. Um, we were working with a prospect once, and we asked them, you know, do you charge for implementation? Yes. Do you make money on it? They had no idea, and they were losing hand over fist on it. And they thought they were breaking even. So you just need to be really, you know, it, it actually should be broken out. Services as a revenue line, services as a cogs line, right? You should know totally where you are on that, um, and it should be part of your strategy. That's a, that's a great transition to, uh, to talk a little bit about pricing models, and I'd like to kind of move into that uh, conversation now. So and it's a, we've got some interesting uh, dichotomy right here on the panel. So Jeremy, you said uh, hardware, yeah, software's where our bread and butter is. See ya, you're like, we don't sell hardware, we sell software, and by the way, you can get some of our software for free. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Um, obviously, you've got a tiered pricing model. We'll walk us through that. So basically, have tier pricing model because customers expect it. So the question is, what do you put in the tier pricing model? And you need to figure out what would you market bear. And there are some things that are absolute necessities that you have to put in your base tiers, or you want to put them in as a lost leader that you have to put in your base tier. But otherwise, if something is nicely, you can put it in your medium or ultimate tier. I recommend. Uh, no, no more than five, but ideally three tier prices because otherwise customers get confused and uh, you know, sort of like a basic or standard and plus and pro is really what they've gotten used to. You could do five, but I uh, think that it should not be there. But the reality of it is that you need to make sure that you present something that the customer could identify with. If you don't have tiers, then somebody may think that they are not going to, it's like, if I only want hamburger, I'm not going to go to a Vegas buffet and pay 45 bucks because I could have my hamburger, but I'm going to pay 45 bucks for all the other things that I don't use. So customers think about it that way. So you want to think about it as to what does it, uh, does the customer identify with, and that's how you're going to decide your tiers. So, so how do you, while we're, while we're with you, how, how do you progress the customer from, you know, the, the, the legacy mindset, right, is yeah. don't train your customers to free, Yeah. right? So how do you move them? Well, that, that's actually a very uh, interesting question, and let me explain why it's interesting. It's because when you're a small business, and I mentioned before, we go with the CAC article ratio. When you're a small business, if you have a suit fly over to a customer and stuff like that, you are going to lose, you know, your customer acquisition costs will be too high. So for our case, we, because we cater to small business, we have a model that one, one of these models that, you know, once again, they're going to say these guys were either geniuses or idiots, but our motto is sales is dead. 
we do not sell our customers. We provide them with marketing and handholding and support to move them to the next step, which is why we wanted to make the barrier to entry zero for them to have them come in, get used to our services, get used to how customer friendly, uh, our customer success managers are bar none and make sure that they need to do that. And then they say, oh, if I need a solution, these guys are pretty good and we gotta go and buy the solution from them. And that's how we grow them. We do not have, and like I said, you may think, call us idiots, but eventually, hopefully geniuses, that uh, we do not have salespeople on our staff. We absolutely do not have anybody on commission or anything like that because it won't work for our market. Our CAC to our ratio will be out of this world and we will, we will lose money. Our focus is on customer growth. 8% um, is a very healthy target and that would be done with marketing and customer churn below 3%, which we're way below 3% by the way, uh, not in the first 90 days. First 90 days is always tough, but after that we're way below 3%. And when you have an 8% growth and less than 3% churn, you have a healthy business. And then you could have your customer support people and your product speak for itself. When you're in the service business, you're as good as your last experience with the customer. You can go to a steakhouse 80 times and have a great steak. You go there twice and you know the steak is bad or management is changed or the service is bad, you can never go there again. So we absolutely uh, treat our customers like gold. Retention is everything, low churn, and, and try to get high growth, and that's how we, we float without a sales person. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking Rob's over there going, I wonder how the board would react with SaaS Capital if I went to them and said, I want to invest in a company that has no sales staff. They don't, they don't sell. Yeah, it's interesting. That was a very strong position. Um, but I think it makes sense. I don't know your market. Um, you offer a freemium solution, so I guess it's SMB or yeah, you know, consumer. Or small business. Yeah, so I think that's okay. I think that makes sense, and I think your strategy makes sense, right? Marketing heavy, um, uh, you know, for enterprise sales, obviously, even, even with the SaaS model, you've got to have salespeople for sure. Um, so I, I, I think it makes sense, the freemium model. The interesting thing with freemium is it can also be for enterprise, right? Because Again, some of the leaders in the SaaS world have shown that um, selling SaaS doesn't have to be at the CTO or CIO level anymore. It can come in at an apartment level and someone can pick up like a little calendar app that helps them schedule meetings or whatever and it can grow from there all across all of GE, right? So it can be a freemium thing and still be an enterprise sale. Uh, so I have an interesting strategy, I don't know, knocks against it, I think. It's right, in fact, we had that situation where there was a little groundswell happening like that. It's just that with the Amazon model, you know, people are, the people who don't want to be sold, they want to buy in my market. Obviously, when you're an enterprise, they expect you to go visit them, and if you don't visit them, they're upset. But in the small business model, they don't want to be sold, and they actually despise, you know, pushy salespeople or, or whatever the stereotype is. They want the opportunity to buy. The downside of it is that your marketing cost is higher. It takes 12 touches for an average small business to buy the product. <coughs> Well, purchase is expensive, and, but it is probably cheaper than us having salespeople on staff and visit. Yeah, so that makes sense. I have a question. I just want to get, get Josh in on this. Does Kessel have a... Uh, uh, so we're a little different. We do have a sales team. Uh, <laughs> Everyone is different now. <laughs> we, uh, you know, our, our sales team, we look at them more as uh, retail consultants. And the goal is that they're not, uh, there's no high pressure sales happening at all. You know, it's, it's more of building a rapport with them and helping them solve a, you know, an issue that they might have in their, their business. And so we want them to be educated on retail and be highly knowledgeable on our product. Uh, the, the unique thing with ours is we also don't do contracts. And so the, uh, you know, the life cycle of the customer is contingent on can you actually deliver what you sold them to people? And can you do it for three years or four years or five years or however long you think you're gonna keep them? And so it keeps us very honest with ourselves. Uh, I would say that it's risky. You know, there's other companies out there right now that are converting more to a contract model uh, and doing monthly pricing. Uh, but we feel that you know when you're in that uh, moment uh, as a retailer looking for a new system, we want the least amount of friction, the most amount of education, and a support team that is incentivized at the same level as the sales team for selling a deal versus keeping a customer. 
in our, you know, in our uh, model, the worst thing that could happen is churn. And so the support team is also incentivized financially to, uh, to retain customers and get reviews to help out the marketing and sales. That's cool. That's interesting. Jeremy, uh, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, we, we've only got a couple minutes left uh, for this panel, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your, uh, I guess, the strategy behind your treatment here your production model. Uh, I mean, it's kind of based on the use case um, within our environment. Um, as they get larger systems within a restaurant environment, it, um, it, it gets cheaper. So it's kind of one to three terminals is an X amount of pricing that kind of competes with the market space. But then when you get you know four, five, six, it, it gets less expensive per device. And then really kind of anything you know larger than that ends up being significantly less because those are fewer and farther between. Um, it does make it a little bit complex. My desire is to suck some of that complexity out of it because it does end up extending the sales cycle as well as extending the you know just this customer engagement. But um, back to Josh's point, like our desire is to consult with them to make them not be part of the 60% that's going to close within the first 18 months. Right. You know, if we're giving them solutions that are going to help their business grow, um, that's what we're looking for. Save costs, you know, save costs, increase revenue. I mean, that's what we are trying to do. And so that's what our sales team, our professional services team, and our support team is trying to do. I just have one point on pricing that I'd like to share before we move on. Um, is just simply, it's our view that the work looking at all these hundreds of SaaS companies we've worked with is uh, set up your pricing so as not to penalize the customer from using the product. Right? There's lots of ways you can structure it. Users, uh, variable based on volume, that kind of thing. So just be really aware of that, that you want them to use it, you know, use it every day and get really engaged with it. So set up your pricing so that they're not discouraged from that. Thank you, guys. All right, so uh, we have we have time for one damn good question. We've got one minute. Uh, one minute. Somebody's got a damn good question. Right here. You know, identify yourself, please. Uh, hi, um, my name is Hank Tan from Dynatouch in uh, Fremont, California. I have a question about, we have a lot of um, competitors coming into our market, like uh, Clover. Compared to traditional micros, Aloha, by the way, we do Asian market, Chinese market, about 90%. We have market share 90% in San Francisco area. So how do you see Clover and micros? And I, I don't think uh, micros will go to the SaaS model and because they control the traditional market already, right? Otherwise, they compete to themselves. We are doing the same thing. Uh, because we charge them to buy the product and charge them annual fee for the support. So can you give some advice on that? Do you want to jump on that? If, if I understand your question correctly, you've got the free point of sale or, or relatively free point of sale in the market space like Clover and, and Harbor Touch and then you've got kind of micros quiet and yeah. Where is the where is the the gap between those? Or is I mean, Microsoft has a SaaS product. They've got a product called Symphony that they've been putting into the market for the last couple of years around version two. It's what Starbucks is running in all of their properties um, nationwide, and they've had that product. And that's really, as I said, talk with some of the Micros resellers at different events. That's what they're pushing. They've kind of taken away that tier four market from Micros, and they're kind of trying to go upstream to tier one and tier two clients. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that there's a space for tier four. I was just talking with Kelly um, from RSPA yesterday. I think in tier four is where you're going to see those free point of sale platforms, the Clovers and the bank owned platforms, whether it's retail, grocery, or hospitality. The, those are going to kind of play into that tier four, not enterprise market, but as you start to go up, the value of software, the value of features, the value of support goes up as your business gets more complex. My opinion, but that's where I think it's going. I think I mean, the other point of SaaS is, are you continuing to build out your product? And if you're in the traditional, uh, what we would consider the legacy model, you're building something that's selling the exact same thing for years and years and years. And uh, you know, for us, we, we believe in the SaaS model. The point of it is, is that you can get into something better for cheaper, and you know that it's going to get better and more features will get put in it every single year. And we even go to the point to where we'll allow retailers to sit on the same pricing model as they expand into additional locations, and we grandfather them in uh, into 
the initial pricing model that they started with. We want them to know that it's about us putting in features and getting a value with, you know, paying a monthly fee. Because over the long term, they're going to pay more. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Unfortunately, this is the trouble with these panel sessions. We can go all day, I'm sure. We just started to scratch the surface. But see you, Josh, Jeremy, and Rob are going to be here throughout the day. Uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to, to chat it up during the networking sessions and answer any questions you might have about a round of applause for these guys.